Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. Essentially, we're a technology company that makes it easy for business to accept payments. And we are focused exclusively on the credit card surcharge model. And you know, for anyone who's not familiar with that model, that's the model that allows businesses, all businesses in the U.S., to pass on their credit card fees when cardholders want to use credit cards for convenience or rewards. That was Michael Tomko, the COO of Cardex, and he is our special guest this week. This is episode 75 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. And hey, before we get started, if you happen to office in Houston, Austin, or North Texas, check out Fuse Workspace, where their mission is to help others do more. Check them out at FuseWorkspace.com. Okay, back to the show. Michael grew up in Columbus, Ohio, went to Harvard College studying philosophy, and then went to Harvard Law School, and he initially worked in real estate. He actually went to high school and Harvard Law School with Cardex CEO, Jonathan Rossi. Cardex is a fintech company that makes it easy for businesses to accept payments with a focus on the credit card surcharging model. The company was started in 2013 and actually doubled their headcount during the last year. Their distribution model is through channel partners, so ISOs, ISVs, and others sell the Cardex solution. Cardex is the only company in payments that leads with surcharging. Everything that Cardex has built is focused on the surcharging model first. They are most differentiated for larger merchants typically selling online with larger ticket items. The surcharging model doesn't work as well for smaller ticket card present businesses. There are now 47 states that allow surcharging, so only three states left that don't allow it. The latest state to allow it was Kansas, and Cardex was a primary driving force behind that change. Michael has a professional passion for helping solve new use cases for surcharging and a personal passion for being in the outdoors, especially hiking. We've got a great episode today about an interesting topic that we haven't talked about, so let's get started. Hi, Michael. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. Tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. Yeah, sure. Happy to. So I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, born and raised. I actually grew up just a couple of miles north of uh, Ohio State's campus. So lifelong Buckeyes fan, family, close friends in Ohio and Actually, growing up in Ohio is where I met our CEO, uh, Cardex CEO, Jonathan Rossi. We went to high school together. So we graduated from the same small high school, graduated in a class of 90 students. And uh, even back then when we were in high school, we were talking about how we wanted to go into business together someday. And back then might have seemed like a long shot, but sometimes things do go according to plan because that's what we're doing today. And after I graduated from high school, went to Harvard College for undergrad. I studied philosophy, mostly foundation of mathematics and some logic, which are kind of far afield of what I do in, in the day-to-day of the business, but really enjoyed that course of study. And after I graduated, I graduated a little bit early so I could get started actually in the real estate business before I enrolled in Harvard Law School. But Harvard Law School, shortly thereafter, kept up with the real estate business the whole time. And our CEO and I were classmates at Harvard Law School, which you know for us was a phenomenal experience. Harvard Law School can be a little bit of a corporate environment. A lot of people who want to go into the big law firms are going to politics. But you know, one thing I think was special about that environment was that we're able to work with a lot of people, be them you know, faculty or classmates, who were really interested in the intersection of business and law. So we made a lot of great friends there, people we still talk to and, and rely on. And of course, that was a fantastic foundation for what we now do at CardX, because what we do is, is really working on removing, eliminating compliance barriers to entry for credit card surcharging. So having that, that background at the intersection of law and business was a great place to start. Okay. Well, I'm surprised you didn't have a stint at Ohio State. I wanted to. I wanted to. But, you know, I wasn't I wasn't quite big enough to make the football team there. They've got a pretty good football team. So <laughs> I figured that my talents would probably be better off in the philosophy department. But no, it's, <laughs> it's a great school. You know, I still have a lot of family connections there. Yeah. Great. Let's discuss Cardex. You brought them up. Obviously, that's the company where you're the COO. But let's talk about the company. Tell us what Cardex does. Yeah, so Cardex is a, you know, we describe ourselves as a fintech company. Essentially, we're a technology company that makes it easy for business to accept payments. 
And we are focused exclusively on the credit card surcharge model. And you know, for anyone who's not familiar with that model, that's the model that allows businesses, all businesses in the US, to pass on their credit card fees when cardholders want to use credit cards for convenience or rewards. So as a technology provider, we provide technology to accept in all environments, whether that's retail with a terminal or e-commerce with a checkout experience, Moto via API, all those different things. And you know, this has been very popular in certain verticals. A lot of B2B merchants are looking at the surcharging option, using the surcharging option. Merchants in businesses that have tighter margins are really interested in surcharging. We have a number of, for example, wholesale distributors whose profit margins are in the single digits and they lean heavily on check and ACH or other means of payment that are a little bit less expensive than cards because if they accept a credit card, they might lose half of their margin. And so surcharging gives them the ability to introduce card payment options without having to absorb that cost. And the company was founded back in 2013. There's been a lot of growth then, both in the markets that we're able to serve since you know there have been a lot of changes to state law and also overall market adoption. So it's definitely a time of fast growth for Cardax, even despite the pandemic circumstances. We doubled our headcount over the course of 2020. So we have just about 30 people in operations and technology, signing up, supporting, building technologies for the thousands of businesses that we currently serve. And our primary distribution strategy is through our channel partners. So we have channel partners who are ISOs, ISVs, processors selling the Cardex product. And so that adds up to dozens of active partnerships and hundreds of individual sales and agents selling Cardex. And so I think this is a, a really interesting moment for surcharging especially with everything that's happening in the market and it's continuing to grow as costs go up and this is available in more and more places. Okay. Yeah, I think we should dive deeper into the surcharging thing in a minute. But first, I wanted to ask you, what do you feel like differentiates Cardex from your competitors out there? It's a great question because we've definitely seen a lot more entrance to the surcharging space over the past couple of years. I mean, I think back to where the market was in 2013 when there were Cardex was sort of the only game in town. I think there have been a lot more companies jumping in with surcharging in response to this market demand. And I would say that probably our biggest differentiator is that we're the only one who's really surcharging first. And I think that differentiates us in a couple of ways. First of all, I think of that in terms of product. A lot of providers, when they want to get started with surcharging, they can do it, basically just they can add a percentage fee and call it a solution. And what we've seen in the market from merchants who have used these solutions and then later signed up for Cardex is it doesn't really solve a lot of the merchant pain points for surcharging. It doesn't come together as a solution. It leaves a lot in the merchant scope. So when you think about our product and our process, everything from application to onboarding to ongoing use is built to support the surcharging model. That goes from things like registrations, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, to handling receipt requirements, itemizing that surcharge on the receipt, Invoicing can be complicated. Refund management ends up being quite complex. And even things that sound like they should be pretty simple from the outside looking in end up being complex. Providers in the space who are are trying to bring a product to market, a lot of times what they'll start with is essentially just a BIM lookup to distinguish between credit and debit, since you can surcharge credit cards, but not debit cards under the card brand rules. Well, what they'll find out very quickly is regardless of what BIN table they're using, issuers are doing all kinds of things that go beyond the BIN. We see significant differences in card products that go beyond first six digits of the card number. And that's why we actually have a a patent pending pricing technology that's enriched with a lot of other data sources, settlement data, the reconciliation files that we get from our different processors to make sure that we're always identifying those cards correctly. And you know, that's how the product ensures compliance. But there's a lot that goes beyond that, I think, into making sure that there's a great merchant experience. A lot of that goes into reporting, reconciliation. When I talk about where we're differentiated in the market, I would say that we're probably most differentiated for larger merchants, for merchants who are doing card not present, for merchants who need to use APIs to build it into certain checkout flows. If you look at the segment of the market that's focused on card present, maybe we're looking at smaller tickets, we're looking at restaurants, you're going to see a lot of different providers there, and they're going to be varying levels of compliance, but they're going to be serving a wide range of businesses. As you go to these, these merchants who are processing more volume and have more exacting requirements, I think that's where we're most differentiated. You know, I believe that Cardex is at present the only surcharging solution that's serving multiple Fortune 500 brands. So that's how I think about it on product. In terms of compliance, I think that's equally important. The card brand rules are very complex. There's not one place you can go and just kind of get the checklist of all the different card brand rules that you have to follow. Different card brands have different nuances. And the state law is becoming increasingly important as well. When we started the company, there were 10 states that had no surcharge laws on the books. Thanks to a series of legal challenges, many of which we've been involved with, 
that list is now down to three. And so I think state law is really important in part because, you know, when a business is, is introducing surcharging, if they're not within the card brand rules, they run the risk of letters from the card brands or their acquirers. They run the risk of fines, maybe shut down or being put on the match list. Those are bad things, but violations of state law are generally come with even tougher punishments. So no one wants to be on the wrong side of compliance. And I think that Cardex is probably, because we're surcharging first, really in the best position to keep apprised and keep building into the technology, these changing requirements, because the requirements are changing a few times a year. I, just one kind of funny story. There was last year, a, a smaller bank rolled out their own surcharging program for the first time, and they did this webinar on it. And their head of compliance was talking about state law. And she said, well, we don't expect any state laws to change in 2020 or 2021. And yeah, I kind of had to laugh at that because if you're really looking, if you're doing the legislative monitoring, if you're engaged with AGs, I mean, the Cardex challenge that we filed in federal court against the Kansas law was already on the record. I mean, and that's to me the Cardex difference. Our software developers could tell you that the law is going to change. Our operations team could tell you the law is going to change. And this bank's head of compliance couldn't tell you the law is going to change because a lot of people who are getting into the space look at surcharging as an add-on, whereas it is just, it's in our DNA. It's the one thing we do, and we're always pushing for more excellence in surcharging. Okay. Okay. So today, 47 states accept surcharging or allow surcharging. Yeah. Yeah. And that's new actually as of uh, just last month because we won that challenge in Kansas. Up to that point, it was 46. So it's a quickly changing landscape. Okay. Let's pretend we're not talking to to payments people, but we're talking to maybe merchants or, or, or folks who may not understand what surcharging is. Can you define it in the terms that you know, say a, a head of head of payments or someone that's just beginning to understand payments, like how would they understand what surcharging means? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, for the business owners we talk to, this is certainly resonant and really relatable because a lot of them are used to getting their merchant statement every month. And they understand that when they get that merchant statement, there are a lot of costs in there. And those costs might be different every month not only in dollar terms, but on a percentage basis, they kind of understand, okay, there's interchange plus, I pay different things for different cards. But that's about as as deep as the understanding goes, I think, for a non-payments audience in a lot of cases. With surcharging, we tell them in the simplest terms is that for all the credit card volume you accept, you're going to pay 0%. So if you sell $1,000 worth of goods on a credit card today, we're going to add that surcharge. Ours is 3.5% for all of our business merchants. We're going to collect that before deposit. We're going to use it to pay all the interchange and expenses that go with that. And tomorrow, you're going to get $1,000 deposited to your bank account. And the beauty of this model, in contrast to some of the other models that have been out there for a while, in terms of convenience fee or other things, is that it's truly cost neutral. So if it's not $1,000 that business is processing, but rather a million dollars that business is processing, or like some of our really big clients, they might have you know a day that's, that's over $10 million. If they process $10 million on credit cards, they're going to receive $10 million to their bank account the next day, and they're never going to have to pay for that interchange because we added that surcharge amount and essentially paid by their customer. And for the audience who's learning about surcharging for the first time, one thing I think is so important to understand is that people always ask about customer reception. They say, hey, you know, my customers used to be able to use their, their MasterCard World Elite or their, their Amex card without having any costs. What's the customer reception going to be? And one thing that I think is so key is that under the card brand rules, the business is allowed to charge a fee for credit cards, but not for debit cards. So as the merchant, you're in this position to communicate really clearly about your prices and say, hey, I have this cost of accepting these credit cards. You're the one making the choice that you want these rewards, miles, cash back. And if you don't value those enough to pay the cost of acceptance that I have as the merchant, you can switch to a debit card, you can switch to ACH, ACH is getting faster all the time. You can switch an alternative payment method and you know we won't charge you an additional fee. But ultimately, what's driving the cost of all these cards? It's kind of the arms race that's going on for rewards. And you know that's what merchants are really, at least in our experience, responding to. They want to be able to reduce their cost of acceptance. They're tired of paying for other people's delta miles and things like that. Mm-hmm. And that's how they think about the, the surcharging conversation. Okay. And you mentioned convenience fees. I think that's something that people have seen in paying their own bills. What is the difference in surcharging and convenience fees? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, convenience fees, I would say, are a much simpler model, but maybe a little bit less economically powerful for a convenience fee. It's something that you offer for a bona fide alternative channel of acceptance. So, you know, if, for example, someone can pay the point of sale and you want to offer them an online option, you can offer them basically that online option with a flat dollar amount convenience fee. 
We actually don't see that done very effectively outside a few specific MCCs, in part because it's really hard to choose a flat dollar amount that's fair for everyone. You know, if you're a business who has some customers who pay you a hundred dollars and some customers who pay you a thousand dollars, what is the appropriate fee? You know, if if thirty dollars offsets your cost for that thousand dollar transaction, well, that's way too much for that hundred dollar payer, right? And if you just try to offset for that hundred dollar payer, you're still gonna be paying a lot for that thousand dollar payer. And you know, again, there's a simplicity within the rules, but it creates reconciliation complexity. It doesn't really cover costs. If you have different ticket sizes, it's very difficult to find the right convenience fee. And for a lot of our big merchants who are doing a lot of invoice payments and those type of things, the alternative channel acceptance thing doesn't really click for their model. You know, if they're serving customers nationally, there's no window to go and and pay without the convenience fee. So we've seen convenience fee sort of be less popular. We see it most of all, like for example, in utilities, if if they're serving home utilities and, and there's a fairly narrow range of costs, or maybe for like events bookings, if they're selling the same ticket and it's the same cost everywhere, then you can get a convenience fee that makes a little bit of sense. But generally surcharging is much more directly in conversation with the cost of acceptance for a given transaction. And the number one barrier to entry there is just meeting all these compliance requirements because there are a lot more rules around surcharging than there are on conveniency. And why do you think it seems to resonate more with online than it does face-to-face or card present? That's a really interesting question. You know, from what we've seen online transactions, I think that it's easier to offer strong alternative payment options. It can be a little bit confusing depending on what the merchant is for card present. If, you know, someone walks into the store, they've only got maybe one card in their wallet at the time. And basically they either pay with that card and they pay the surcharge or they don't buy the product. Now, that's not to say that we do a lot in specialty retail. We do a lot in building products. Some of those card present transactions can work really well. But I think part of the reason that it's so compelling for card not present is that these are larger transaction sizes. And a lot of these card not present merchants are maybe more used to ACH or check and introducing credit card payments as a new option now that they have a way to do it that's cost neutral and actually makes it affordable for them to introduce that option. Hey, everyone. As you know, I've worked in the payment space for a long time. A lot has changed over the years, and we talk about those changes a good bit on the show. But some things in this industry never change. For example, attrition is always a concern, and so is your bottom line. And PCI noncompliance fees will always be a part of the industry, driving that bottom line, but also keeping us up at night, worrying about that attrition, especially when the inevitable PCI noncompliance fee hike is underway. That's why I'm excited to bring in Company.com as a sponsor. Right when you're increasing fees, give your merchants something of value too. The Company.com security suite is the perfect way to add value by offering a real-time security dashboard with antivirus, expert tech support, anti-phishing software, dark web scanning, and more. Company.com offers various product assortments and solutions that have proven to reduce merchant attrition for years now, and this new security suite that complements your current PCI program will be a game changer for you. Learn more at www.company.com or email securitysuite at company-corp.com. The link is also on our website. And now back to my interview with Michael Tomko, the COO for Cardex. So yeah, I wanted to dive a little deeper into the recent Kansas win. Can you kind of maybe talk through what was the state before and then what did you guys do to take it to court? And then what sort of, what's the post, you know, award look like for the state of Kansas? Yeah, you know, this is actually one that, that goes way back to the New York case. So essentially, when New York's law was challenged by a group of plaintiffs who were New York merchants who had the New York no surcharge law enforced against them, that case was taken all the way to the Supreme Court and a bunch of think tanks, a bunch of big merchants joined that case as they they drafted the amicus briefs, they joined in support of those plaintiffs. And Cardex actually joined as well. Uh, We're the only payments company to provide a brief in that case. And essentially, the whole conversation around these state laws is that these state laws are uniform. They're all identical to one another in their language. And they all explicitly permit a discount while restricting surcharging. And so that creates kind of an interesting dynamic, right? Because essentially, the argument before the Supreme Court and the the argument has subsequently opened up other states 
this has been a regulation of speech rather than conduct, right? It's essentially saying that if you want to offer a discount, that's fine. But if you want to add a surcharge for credit, that's not an option. It's like saying, I could tell you, well, it's warmer in Dallas than it is in Chicago, but I can't say it's colder in Chicago than it is in Dallas, right? (laughs) And so that was the big issue in that Supreme Court case. And it was an 8-0 to victory for us, essentially saying that this is protected speech under the First Amendment. So that was basically subject to First Amendment scrutiny. All these state laws had to be evaluated. And so there were ongoing challenges in a lot of states. And that's how a lot of these dominoes started to fall. That's how we got Florida, California, Texas. And from that point, we had a short list of states left where there were no active merchant challenges. And so at that point, we thought, okay, how do we bring this to all 50 states? Because especially for those large merchants we serve, they want to have a national pricing strategy. They want to serve all their customers in all 50 states exactly the same way. And so we kind of picked up that mantle and carried it forward. So that started with Oklahoma. We actually worked with a state senator there, Senator Brooks, to bring this issue to the attention of the Attorney General of Oklahoma in late 2019. And the Attorney General issued an opinion letter essentially saying, look, we've reviewed the constitutional precedent here. We've looked at what's happened in other states. This Oklahoma law can't be enforced. So that opened up Oklahoma to our surcharging model. And then from there, it was Kansas. And that option wasn't available. You know, every state kind of has its own way of doing things. And so what we actually did was file a case in federal court saying that, you know, our First Amendment rights as Card X were being infringed upon by this Kansas statute, which was outdated. We had really strong constitutional precedent. Certainly when we won that case, we weren't surprised by the result, but with litigation, you never know. So we were pretty happy to get that result. But this was one thing that I thought was really cool for us is as a fintech company, I think every fintech company has to take compliance really seriously. And there's probably a sense in which financial innovation only moves at the speed of regulation. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a company that's regulatory leader, we're in the best position to actually show in our statement of facts how a surcharge works, what those disclosures look like, how that fee is displayed on the checkout form, how there's no consumer surprise. Because obviously, even with the constitutional precedent, people want to understand the policy interest. They want to understand how this is good for businesses, how it's good for consumers. And you know, the fact that we serve thousands of businesses nationwide is a big part of why we were, we were the ones who were able to carry that case forward in Kansas and get that win. Okay. And what are the three states that currently don't allow it? So we have Colorado, Connecticut, and Massachusetts left as the remaining three. And so mm-hmm. I think we're going to continue to see movement there. You know, when it's a list of 10 states, the spotlight isn't on the remaining ones in the same way and to the same extent. And actually talking with policymakers nationwide, we've seen kind of just organically a groundswell of support for changing those laws in different ways because a lot of merchants have been infected by the pandemic. We all know that increases to interchange are coming. Those are going to be significant. And so lawmakers in in some of those states are actually looking opportunities to change those laws. And we're actively working with lawmakers in those states to try to find you the best path forward. We think it's really important. Visa and MasterCard's rules, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking about how they're complex. But I haven't really explicitly said, I think they're very good rules. I think that if you're complying with all these rules from Visa and MasterCard, they're very cardholder friendly. You know, a cardholder is not going to be surprised. They're going to understand what the surcharge is. They're going to understand what they're paying. If there's a refund, that will be handled appropriately. The receipt will break this out really clearly. And so what we really like to do is, is try to harmonize those state laws with the card brand rules to the maximum extent possible to make this option even more available in the market. Where do you think all of this is headed, say, in the next two to three years? And really, the question's more around the industry payments as a whole, but certainly, I think it would make sense if you kind of put the surcharging lens on that question and kind of answered it from that perspective. Yeah. Well, to kind of zoom out and think about the macro view on the payments industry, certainly applies to surcharging as well, is that we've really seen over the last year, a lot of our merchants who have always been very comfortable with card present, maybe never really gotten over the technical barrier to entry of of accepting card not present payments, setting up a hosted payment page, putting it on their website or whatever it may be, they've had to adapt to the circumstances. And a lot of them have gotten used to card not present payments and all the convenience that comes with those card not present payments. And now there's this sort of interesting dynamic that stores are reopening, foot traffic is picking back up. And so they're going back and they're looking at their terminal from, you know, maybe 2019 and thinking, you know, I think there's a better way to do payments. And so I think the really big trend, both within surcharging and outside of surcharging, is going to be a push to omni-commerce. I think businesses are going to want to be able to accept payments for card present and card not present in ways that increasingly converge, where they can look at a single reporting interface, they can manage their transactions from a single interface. 
I think some of the companies that gain the most ground over the next two or three years are going to be the ones who deliver all the conveniences that merchants are now used to and expect from that card not present context for the card present as well as as sort of a complement. And I think that's going to be the story both for traditional processing and for surcharging. And I also think that surcharging right now is is really at an inflection point. As costs continue to go up, businesses are really struggling to pay a lot of expenses. I think a lot of businesses have had to make difficult decisions about cuts in the past year. And I think they have a different perspective on what they can live without. And we've seen some studies from merchant advocacy groups saying that for a lot of American businesses, their cost of processing is one of their top three operating costs. And so to be able to remove that line item entirely, especially at a time when rates are going to go up significantly, I think is really appealing. Just to sort of broadcast out a couple of years into the future, when we look at Australia, you know, they've had the surcharging rules for about 10 years longer than the US has. And they're over 40% of businesses use surcharging for at least some of their channels. And it's even more common for large businesses. 60% of large businesses are using surcharging in at least some contexts. I don't necessarily know that the US is going to take surcharging that far. And again, the US is the world's most expensive market for interchange. So I do think there's going to have to be a little bit more give and take. And I think that a lot of merchants, especially in those those key verticals who are facing that price pressure, are going to be looking at surcharging. Okay, that's good insight there. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So tell us a little bit about your journey to your role there as the COO at Cardex. Yeah, yeah. It was an interesting journey. Like I mentioned earlier, Jonathan, our CEO, and I have been lifelong friends. But when I was in law school, I was in the real estate business. I was working mostly on historic redevelopment. And uh, if any of my professors are listening to this podcast, you can just pretend I didn't say this, but I was flying back to Columbus every week to work on those projects and meet with my general contractors and architects and you know, kind of running those two paths in parallel, the, the legal education the, and the real estate development business. And I loved it. I found it really rewarding, really energizing. But I was one of the first investors in Cardex as well. And I saw what Jonathan was doing. You know, One of the smartest people I've ever had the privilege to work with, super talented. And Cardex just seemed like a really special opportunity to me because if you talk to a lot of people in real estate development, what they'll tell you is you, know, you take on a big historic redevelopment project. Maybe it's a 100-year-old building that's 12 stories tall. You work on that and you work on that. And at the end of two, three, four years, you've revitalized this building and it feels great in one sense, but it's still a 12-story building, right? Payments is a very different kind of dynamic. You know, you have the opportunity to scale and change an industry. And that's why about four years ago, I started full-time at Cardex. I saw the opportunity to take a company that was had hundreds of active merchants using the solution. And I saw the potential to, you know, over the course of the coming years, grow it to hundreds of thousands of active merchants. And you know, I, I don't think those kind of opportunities come along very often in life. I saw the team that was being put together at Cardex, some really incredibly talented people. And I thought it was something really special to be involved in. So kind of uh, rolled up my sleeves. I, I didn't have any payments experience from the historic redevelopment. I knew a little bit about finance. I worked a lot with banks back then. Redevelopment is a very compliance-driven space. So I had some idea how to work with with regulators and you know work within the rules to get projects done. So from day one, I was rolling up my sleeves, working a lot with our clients, understanding their requirements, trying to advance our technology. And you know, I just had the good fortune of working with some really great people who were very experienced in the industry. And uh, yeah, you know, at a company that's that size and growing quickly, you know, it's just a small company. When I joined, you know, we had half dozen people. You kind of have to learn, right? You know, that's one of the great things about necessity is that you just you find a way. And that was my experience getting started. Okay. What are some things you're passionate about? So maybe one work-related thing and one non-work-related thing. Yeah. You know, in terms of the work, I would say probably the most rewarding thing, the thing I'm most passionate about is when we get to tackle brand new use cases, greenfield opportunities in the payment space. Because a lot of what we do with surcharging isn't kind of incremental improvement on what's already been done. Surcharging is almost an entirely different way of thinking about payments and how the cost is handled and how it's communicated to the cardholder. And so I really relish the opportunity to work, especially with our largest clients, on things that's never been done before in surcharging, like a particular ERP integration and thinking about how to account for the surcharge fees and what they need to do for automatic reconciliation or how it should work in their particular electronic invoice presentment and payment workflows. Those things I find to be super energizing. I get to work with some you know, really smart technical people. And also it's a ton of fun to work with these client companies because I think they really value... There's a really funny anecdote from one of our big clients in the technology hosting space. They said, you know, when we got started with Cardex, we were used to using one of the big processors. 
they sent us a documentation spec that's about 800 pages long. It's like reading War and Peace. And you guys sent us instead this website and uh, a Postman collection, which is essentially a testing tool where they can just click a button and start testing API calls and responses. And they're like surcharging something that's newer in the market. We felt like we were kind of at the cutting edge, but you know, being able to just get hands on with that and the level of support that your team provided may feel like we were on the bleeding edge. And, and those are the things that I think are really rewarding when you can work with a client, build that level of trust and really accomplish something new that is a win, win, win. You know, it's a win for the merchant. It's a win for Cardex. And it's also a win from their customer's perspective, because again, I really have to stress the most important thing in surcharging is making sure there's a great cardholder experience. And I definitely take a lot of pride in, in when we can do that. So that's what I'm passionate about in the work. Outside of work, I love the outdoors. Uh, any chance I can get, I love to spend time outside. Chicago, a little bit of flatland here. Not not the best place to go hiking, but I found a good few good parks around the city, a few good ones in Illinois. But prior to that, I was you know doing a lot of traveling. I had a chance to go out to Jackson, Wyoming, hike some of those mountains, go out to Death Valley, one of my favorite national parks. And uh, actually, in late 2019, went hiking with a buddy of mine, Grand Canyon. We actually hiked all the way from the South Rim to the North Rim. is a is a big trip and He's a farmer in his day job, so he's on his feet all day, every day, moving around. You know, the most the most activity I get at work is when I switch my standing desk from sitting to standing. So <laughs> I, I had a hard time keeping up with him, but you know, we both made it across, and that's what I'm looking forward to. Really, post pandemic is being able to travel again. I've got a list, you know, a couple of parks I want to go to in Montana and Alaska, and and get back to hiking a little bit. Yeah, I think there's a lot of. A lot of pent up demand for traveling and getting back to uh, doing things that people enjoy that involve traveling. So I'm sure we're going to see an uptick in that part of the industry for sure. Yeah, I, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I, I think everyone's feeling the same way. This next question, it's sort of a standard question I always ask, but I, I think the reason that it's interesting is because people come from a lot of different backgrounds, different perspectives, and I think you have one that's different. So coming into this industry, for example, me 16 years ago, I had no payments experience, wasn't even looking at payments as an industry or a career, where I think today that's much different, right? There's so much investment in this industry now that fintech is part of it. It's the financial side and the technology side and bring that all together with payments. And it's become sort of a sexy industry to be in. So curious your perspective, your advice. So someone's coming right out of college, they want to get into payments, they want to get into fintech. What would your advice be to them for them to be successful in their careers? That is a fantastic question. You know, I should say at Cardax, we've definitely hired a lot within the industry. You know, we've hired a few people from big processors. We've hired a lot from PayPal because they have have a big presence here in Chicago with Braintree. But we also hired just as much from people who have no industry experience. And, you know, the advice I'd give general is kind of the same advice I give to them, which is don't be afraid of the jargon. You kind of have to embrace it. It's kind of like immersion learning of a new language, right? You can study the dictionary, you can do all the vocabulary, but at some point you just have to kind of get into those conversations and see how people are using these different payment terms and concepts in different contexts and how your clients understand it, how your partners understand it. And you know, you just have to kind of trust that there'll kind of gradually be that understanding and one day it's going to click and you'll be like, okay, I, I kind of get how all these different pieces fit together and how to use this vocabulary. I think that one of the things that's most important for anyone who's getting started in payments is to not think too narrowly about it. If you're a software developer in payments, there's obviously going to be more to learn about the software side of payments than anyone can learn in one lifetime. But at the same time, don't be afraid to kind of think broadly. You know, If you have the opportunity to sit in on a sales call and hear how merchants are talking about payments, that's a phenomenal opportunity. And all the salespeople I know love when they can bring a software developer on a call. They love to bring the, the big guns out, always you know, have a show of force with, with an important prospect. So that's good. And you know, at the same time, as a software developer, you might know kind of your closed ecosystem and everything you're doing with your technology, your APIs, your web applications. But if you sit down with someone from your operations team and really understand how billing settings work on different platforms, it's really going to enrich your knowledge of how your systems have to interface with this broader financial ecosystem. So my advice is always just to look for an opportunity where you're not going to have to go too narrow. You're going to be able to kind of keep your head up and learn what's happening more broadly. And I think you know, people who really embrace that opportunity and they write down their questions and they learn from their colleagues who are really passionate about payments. You know, That was my experience talking to people who've been in the industry a lot longer than I have who were able to teach me all those things. I think that if people are willing to do that and just approach it with a, a level of enthusiasm, they can learn enough to be dangerous very quickly. So that's the great thing about fintech is that this industry is growing and evolving so rapidly. 
that you just have to be a lifelong learner to thrive in fintech. It's a different industry than it was even five years ago. And that's the beauty of it. And again, it's just the same qualities that you need kind of starting out are the ones that I'd encourage everyone, you know, payments to embrace, which is just, you know, being a lifelong learner. I think that's some great advice. Well, we've covered a lot of ground so far, specifically around you and Cardex and surcharging. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I just wanted to thank you very much for making the time. It was great talking with you and uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Michael, thank you so much for being on the show. I know your time is very valuable, so I really appreciate you being here. It's great to connect with you. Thank you. Thank you. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well.